Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals but without all the voodoo. I'm back for another video from headquarters and in this video I want to talk to you guys about subwoofers. But before we get started, real quick, if you want to watch the rest of the videos in this series, have a look at the link in the card. And if you're in the market for a new speaker and you're considering head audio, have a look at the link in the description. That's an affiliate link where you can support both me and head audio, obviously, at no extra cost to you. So if you're thinking about buying a head speaker, have a look at that link. But with that, let's get into the video. This is the first in a two-part series about subwoofers. So in this first one, I want to talk to you about how to pick the right subwoofer. And then in the second video, we're going to look at placing and setting it up. But again, right now, let's discuss what you need to look out for to pick the right subwoofer to complement your speakers. Right? So what brand should you pick? What size should you pick and why? Let's get into that. So the short answer to this question really is you want to get a subwoofer from the same brand that you got your speakers from. Ideally, you even want to get a subwoofer that is intended to match your particular speakers from that manufacturer. And this is all about phase matching, right? So in the crossover region between the subwoofer and the speaker, you want the phase of those two speakers to be aligned so that you're not getting a, a, an interference, a destructive interference that will lead to a dip in the frequency response. At its core, it's that simple and that's what I want to show you in this video. Let's see in practice what happens if you set up your sub, if you align your sub, if you don't get the phase match right between your sub and your speakers. But to do that in this room, we need to prepare a slightly special measurement setup because this room is so messy that if I just kind of picked a standard 2.1 arrangement with the sub kind of underneath the speaker, the impact of the room is so great that I can't actually show you reliably what I want to show you. So we're going to set up a, a sort of a test setup with the speaker and the sub and the microphone on the floor so that we can reduce the effect of the room in particular boundary interferences to a minimum but while still kind of mimicking the, the, the spatial placement of the sub and the speaker in relation to each other. So let's do that now. Okay, so what I set up here is the sub and the speaker next to each other with the idea being that they're basically sitting flush and that the distance to the microphone on the floor here is about the same both from the sub and the speaker obviously. Yeah? In terms of hooking it up, it's just the standard hookup, so the standard connection where my audio interface feeds the subwoofer and the subwoofer feeds the Type 07 through the satellite out. One particular thing to note is that when we do this, there's a switch on the back of the satellite of the Type 07 where we need to compensate for the phase effects that the high pass filter in the sub puts in in order to actually drive the satellite. But with that, this is basically the standard setup as vanilla as it gets to mimic what an ideal kind of 2.1 combination would be in a treated room or in a, in a free field scenario where the room doesn't have a crazy amount of impact. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just measure the sub and the satellite, the speaker, separately so that we can compare 
the phase response and actually see that they are aligned. I'm then going to flip the phase on the subwoofer. I'm going to shift it by 180 degrees actually to show you that we can actually see that change and that discrepancy between the sub and the satellite when I do that. So let me have a go at that. Okay, so in case you missed that in the real-time measurements, I took the first measurement of the speaker alone, the Type 07. And what we can see here is just the, the standard response in smart. So we've got the frequency response at the bottom and the phase response in the middle. And if I just set this cursor here at kind of the 80 hertz mark, that's the crossover frequency that is set in the sub currently. We can see kind of where that sits, but if I enable the, the sub, we can see that it basically mimics the response of the speaker of the Type 07 exactly, right? So they are perfectly in phase at the moment. But then I shifted the phase by 180 degrees in the sub. And so I'm just gonna disable the view for the speaker and just show you the sub. And now with the 180 degrees phase shift, we can see that represented here in the measurements as well, right? So this is obviously just the sub and the speaker on their own. What we're interested in is what happens when we combine the two. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to play both together with the phase shift in place, and we should see that destructive interference show up in the frequency response. And then I'm going to flip the switch back to zero degrees and what we should see is that dip come back up and the frequency response to be once again in its kind of constructive interference neutral flat state. So that's what I'm going to do now. So there we go. With the phase shift enabled, with that discrepancy between the two responses, we can see what dip that creates around the crossover frequency. But then once I flip that back into phase, we can see how that destructive interference becomes constructive again and the frequency response flattens out. So obviously these are just test conditions and I'm sure a question you have is what does that actually look like when I would, if I were to put the speaker and the sub back, I'm not actually going to do it now. And the reason is that once you put this back into a standard kind of 2.1 arrangement where the sub is just kind of positioned next to underneath the speaker, basically, we still get the same effect. But at that point, the room does its thing as well. And so this effect that, we're, that is fairly clear here is potentially going to be masked by all the effects, all the distortion that the room also imparts on the response, right? So if you put this back, if you were to, to, to analyze this in a standard 2.1 arrangement, you would still see this effect but it would probably be hidden a bit depending on your exact circumstances. Of course, it is still important to get this right, even if it is sort of hidden, because it is just one more step towards a transparent response from your system, right? I mean, acoustics and, and speakers in rooms is all about removing as many of the kind of distortion effects that you get in order to get closer and closer to a a response from your speakers that resembles what they're actually fed with, the signal that they're actually playing. And so this is the main effect that you want to get rid of, or this is the main problem that you need to get right if you're integrating a subwoofer into your stereo system. 
Of course, Head Audio has one more trick up their sleeves, and that is the linearizer that works across the entire system. So let me just show you that real quick. So at the moment, we did all of this with the linearizer disabled, and I'm gonna just turn on the measurement again and engage the linearizer, and we'll see what happens to the phase response. So there we go. Once I enabled the linearizer, we can see just what effect that has on the phase response. We're obviously also seeing an increase in overall latency, as I mentioned in the video on the phase linearizer and phase compensation. Obviously, we need a sort of a buffer time window for those filters in the speakers to do the phase compensation. And so there's an, an extra latency that gets added. But Overall, we get something that is basically phase linear down to around about, let's say, 45 hertz, at least sort of from what I'm seeing here. And below that, the, the compensation doesn't happen in the sub just because it would cost us too much latency in, in the overall system. But still, interesting to see, and obviously this works both in the ported version, the ported configuration of the speakers as I've got them here now, and also the closed cabinet version as well. Okay, with all of that said, I wanna just say something about the size of the subwoofer that you should consider, right? So should you go with something like this with an eight inch, inch driver? Should you get something bigger, 10 inch, 12 inch even? And the simple answer is, and the stupid answer to be honest as well, is you want to get the biggest sub that you can afford. And the reason is very simple, and that is that the bigger the driver, the lower down it will play, so the more bass extension you'll get. But it's also about volume. I think what most people underestimate is just how much volume a smaller, or how little volume a smaller sub can play. So for example, in a configuration like this, where you are combining sort of a standard six inch two-way speaker with an eight inch sub, with one eight inch sub, you'll actually end up with more bass extension, but an overall lower max SPL, if you will. Yeah? So you really need big drivers, big surface area to move all that air in order to get proper volume to get proper SPL. Yeah? So in my personal opinion, things really only start getting fun with subs of like 12 inches, 12 inch, with 12 inch drivers and more. Yeah? This is obviously just my opinion, but um, that's kind of what I've, I've seen or that's what I recommend. Because if you really want that oomph from your low end, if you really want something that gets close to something that sounds, for example, like a club sound system, you really need that size. Obviously, you can still have fun with a smaller subwoofer, yeah, don't get me wrong, but uh, if, you, if you really want that sound pressure, if you want that volume, you need to go big. Yeah? So get the biggest sub that you can afford. In my opinion, that's best is a 12-inch sub or more. So to summarize what we've learned today and to answer that question, what sub should you get to best complement your speakers? Remember, it's pretty easy. Get a sub by the speaker's manufacturer for the main reason that it is hopefully built to integrate properly and to get a proper phase match between the sub and the speaker when you hook them up. In terms of size, go big. Go big, go go. Now, you can, you can get something smaller, but if you really want to feel that low end, if you want something that really resembles something that you hear in a club system, you want to get 12 inches of uh, 12 inch driver diameter or more. And with that, let me just quickly remind you that if you're setting up a new studio and you need to figure out how to set up your speakers, how to place your setup in this new room, I've got a free video workshop for you. It's the Phantom Speaker Test, how to set up your speakers correctly, no matter what room you're in. 
if you're starting out, it can usually be pretty tricky to figure out in a home studio which side to face, this side, that side, what to do about doors, windows. It's very easy to get confused about whether to put your speakers on your desk, on stands, whether to use the coupling, and in what kind of sequence to think about all these things. So I've prepared this workshop for you, which guides you through that process step by step of finding the ideal listening position in your room to get an even bass response and to set up your speakers so it sounds like you're working on headphones. This is the Phantom Speaker Test that you can sign up for free at the link in the description. So with that, let's finish up this video. I hope it was insightful to you. You have no idea how much work I had to put in to get this configuration working and to actually show you what I wanted to show you. Subs are finicky beasts. And in order to kind of get this right, you really want to stick to kind of the, the options that your manufacturer gives you and just stay within that realm of how they intended it to be used. But with that, let's continue to learn to trust our ears and get back having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.